price of coal despite being a coal abundant country. What economic reason can justify the continued monopoly of Coal India despite its repeated underperformance? Is it simply that coal unions brook no defiance? Similarly, is the reason why we limit FDI in areas like insurance, legal services and accounting services only so that we can give local players a rent? Can a poor country like ours afford such corporatist policies? We used to have socialist policies that taxed over 100% of the income a wealthy man declared. Thankfully, we've moved away from that. But with marginal tax rates for the rich set at a low 34% or so, even with the recent surcharge, it is astonishing how few of the rich declare their full incomes. Only 42,000 declared an income over rupees 1 crore, as the finance minister said in the budget speech. Unless far more of the rich pay their fair share, it will become easy to conflate being rich with being criminal, opening the door once again to the popular confiscatory policies of the past. Finally, because agricultural productivity has lagged behind overall growth, and because so much of our population is still tied to agriculture, the pressure to offer SOPs such as cheap credit and loan waivers, TVs, cell phones, etc. has increased. Far better to provide real investment in areas like irrigation, reduce distortionary subsidies such as free electricity, and create good jobs outside agriculture. But populist policies are so much more attractive because they pay off before elections and not just in the long run. You can almost hear the politicians say, so what if we risk ruining the government's finances? At least we will stay in power. I said all three bad outcomes are possible in India today. However, I feel confident we will do much better, finding a mutually reinforcing equilibrium between democracy and free enterprise. In a sense, democracy itself poses both the necessary questions and offers the answers that will set us on the right road. First, our young population wants jobs, and for that we will have to keep growth high. As growth has slowed in recent months, a soul searching has begun for what has gone wrong. Fortunately, the answers are not difficult. In the short run, we need to fix problems in the, go in the coal and gas sectors. For without energy, we do not have power, and without power, we do not have growth. The issues here are not insurmountable, but they need steady and determined effort. We also need coordination and implementation within the government better than we've done so far, to ensure that projects once started will be finished on time. That will also give impetus for new projects to start and give industrialists confidence. As a country, we need more investment, we need more savings, and we need, at least for the time being, less consumption. So not only does the government need to save more and spend less, especially on distortionary subsidies, but households need to be incentivized to increase financial savings. Lower inflation, will help here. Over the medium term, what we need is better infrastructure, better governance, more effective and streamlined regulation, vigorous competition, and better skills and education in the workforce. These are clearly priorities of the government, but we have to deliver on them. Let me give you just one example of what lies ahead if we are successful, of what is coming. Think of the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, a project with Japanese collaboration entailing over $90 billion in investment, which will link Delhi to Mumbai sports, covering an overall length of 1483 kilometers and passing through six states. This project will have nine mega industrial zones, high-speed freight lines, three ports, six airports, a six-lane intersection-free expressway connecting the country's political and economic capitals, and a 4,000 megawatt power plant We've already seen a significant boost to economic activity as India built out the golden quadrilateral highway system. The boost to jobs and growth from the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor can only be imagined. Therefore, there is a lot of hope, provided we can do what is needed to realize it. Ultimately, for our democracy and our free enterprise system to reinforce each other, we need a, con a consensus on a number of issues. Let me enumerate them before concluding. First, we have to agree that a good job is the best form of inclusion. 
Rather than assuming the poor need an increasing array of handouts, they should be empowered to equip themselves and their children to become effective contributors to the economy. Where the poor need help? They should get targeted cash transfers which they can spend on education, food or health care that they want, whether from a private provider or a government provider. Better they make choices than have the choices of some remote government of civil society thrust upon them. We must also remember, remember that the line between equipping the poor to get decent jobs and populist vote buying is a thin one and governments must be careful not to cross it. To raise resources for such spending, and it will require some resources, the rich must play their part. The government must broaden the tax base, both by finding and penalizing tax evaders, and also giving them incentives to declare their income by increasing the status associated with legitimacy. Tax evasion in our country must be seen as shameful rather than clever, and tax payment as responsible rather than stupid. Indeed, why not give a Padma Bhushan to the highest income taxpayer in the country every year as a recognition of their carrying out their national responsibility? The government also has to do its part. It has to become more transparent and responsive to the people as well as more efficient in carrying out what is needed. Fortunately, information technology can help tremendously by giving people more of a sense of what their due is and making clear which part of the government is proving wasteful, corrupt, or a bottleneck. Now you are going to work in an India which will increasingly become self-assured, bringing with ideas and energy, and which will play an enormous positive role in the world. I think India could offer an alternative view of development, one that combines free enterprise with democracy, bringing together cutting-edge innovative companies with bottom-of-the-pyramid services. We could teach both the West and the rest, even while learning from them, as we did in the historic past when we were a global broker of ideas. We could be a voice for good in the international arena. You have the capacity to make all this possible, and I'm sure you will. So, when I leave Delhi, or when I stay in Delhi and see the young people in my office, or I see young people like you in the audience, I see the hope for our future. This is then the message I want to leave you with. India is changing, and probably for the better. You will be able to shape the world and your place in it. By all means, you should set yourself ambitious goals. You must also remember that as both ancient Indian philosophers and modern-day behavioral psychologists say the achievement of narrow personal goals, greater wealth, rapid promotion, or increasing fame, rarely brings you anything other than brief pleasure. I don't claim to know the secret of happiness, but this seems obvious. If you like the journey, if you get pleasure from the work you do, it matters far less when or indeed whether you reach your destination. You have far more control over the journey you choose, and often the most enjoyable journeys are those where your goals are broader and where you take others with you, especially others who could not make it without your help. In doing so, you will make this world and India a better and a more democratic place. Let me conclude. You've been very patient li in listening to me. Congratulations once again. Thank you. I wish you good luck in your future endeavors and hope they're crowned with success. Thank you very much.